Okay, welcome everybody. Um, I am going to start with the housekeeping, but just to say firstly that I'm Juanita Cox, one of the co-founders of Guyana Speaks, and I'm here today with Rod Westmus, um, the other half of Guyana Speaks. Um, just to say, can you please keep your audio on mute, um, just so that it doesn't interrupt any of the speakers, and then at the end when we go to the Q&A, um, you can unmute when you're asking questions, but in the meantime, please just use the chat facility um, to comment or ask any questions while we're going along. Um, as I mentioned earlier, for those uh, who are here at, uh, what is it, 3.30 on the dot, um, if you're unidentifiable by name, we will have to then move you back into the waiting, uh, waiting room so that you can have your name um, adjusted. And, um, but other than that, um, I just wanted to say we haven't actually done a Zoom event since I think it's May was maybe the last one. Um, and it's because we've been doing a lot of in-person events. So uh, Rod did the Best of Guyana tour where he took a group of, I believe about 10 people um, to Guyana. And we're gonna be doing that again next year. So if anybody's interested in joining us on a Best of Guyana tour next year, then let us know via the guyanaspeaks at gmail.com address. We also had on the 19th of June, um, an event called Remembering the Ship in Citizenship with John Agard and Tobago Cruzo. And that was part of a, a celebration of the Windrush 75. We then had um, a summer market, Stabrook Stalls, uh, which was really brilliant. That was based in uh, at Draper Hall, Elephant and Castle. Um, and we managed to raise some money as well um, following the fire in Madia. And then very recently, we tried doing a workshop that was based around the Senate House Library and the collection that it has on Sam Batch Tinney. And we basically... Um, use the workshop as an opportunity to kind of center the African in the workshop um, uh, at a workshop the Carinia Sharples run called uh, Poetic Justice. Uh, I know uh, Rod Westmus is involved in transcribing as was um, Wayne McWatt so um, they might tell you a little bit about that later on. Um, but also um, last Wednesday we had a panel discussion with Charlie Gladstone who went to well, he's actually returned back from Guyana recently, having um, offered an apology on the part of his um, ancestor, uh, John Gladstone, uh, for his involvement in slavery and also in indentureship. And the event included Thomas Harding. Um, I uh, was obviously an old version of this form because we had Eulalie Burnham and also uh, Dr. Michelle uh, Santowa. Um, I wanted to mention before we go into the programme that in December, on the 9th of December, we will be hosting Border Bazaar, the usual Border Bazaar market, and we're currently seeking storeholders. So if there's anybody online that knows of anyone who might be interested in selling their produce at Draper Hall, um, do let us know. Uh, it costs £20 to book a, £22 to book a space. And for those who just want to turn up and enjoy the day, it's uh, two pounds at the entrance, but um, it's a date for the diary, 9th of December, 11 a.m. till 4 p.m. And then for those who are newcomers, just to say that Guyana Speaks has been going for six years now, since um, 2017. And if you're interested in joining future events, you can either uh, join up via Facebook or via Twitter, which our Twitter handle is JC Westmus. 
or you can email us again at guyanaspeaks at gmail.com and we can add you to our email circular. So I'm just going to yeah. stop the share. Um, just to say, we've our two speakers today, um, we've got Dr. Julia Smith and Dr. Mara Thornton. We're going to start off first with uh, Julia Smith, whose um, presentation is titled Beyond the Black Box. Just to say that um, Julia Smith actually received her PhD from the University College London in 2016. She specializes in modern and contemporary art with an emphasis on the legacies of empire in Britain and across the Atlantic world. Her book project is entitled Living Landscapes, Nature as Colonial Agent in Guyanese Art. When? Next weekend. And um, I am just going to put somebody who's on here on mute. Um, and um, yeah, so it considers visual objects and literary texts produced in the second half of the 20th century alongside contemporary artworks that mobilize geophysical entities and climatic phenomenon in support of counter-hegemonic critiques of colonial and neo-colonial regimes of oppression and environmental exploitation. So um, welcome, Julia, to today's Guyana Speaks. I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you, Juanita. Um, yes, well, thank you um, to you and Rod, first of all, for having me and to everyone who attended. Um, as uh, Juanita says, I am my, I'm an art historian um, and my background is thinking about mid 20th century art, um, particularly in a kind of expanded British context. That's what I did my PhD on. And then uh, at one point I came across Aubrey Williams's work and that sort of changed uh, quite significantly what I was doing. And it's worth probably pointing out that when I did my degree or master's degree, uh, when, I, when I came to the UK to study all the first period of my studies, there wasn't really anyone, certainly not at UCL, but in many other universities across the country, it wasn't someone who was teaching uh, work like Aubrey Williams's work or work by many artists of the Caribbean and Guyanese diaspora. There were a few lecturers who offered that curriculum in a few, few different departments, um, but most history of art departments didn't have that on offer, uh, which is something that is changing now. Um, and and so I came to uh, Aubrey Williams's work um, very late, shamefully late for someone who was a supposed expert in the post-war period in Britain in the 1950s. And, um, and yeah, and since then there's sort of been no going back really because um, Aubrey Williams's paintings in particular, um, I, I still find sort of 10 years on completely fantastic and engaging and absorbing. And, and over time I've just built up um, kind of a, a, a series of interests that led me to work mostly on artists with Guyanese heritage to the point that I just had to stop and think, okay, well, I'm basically thinking only about Guyanese artists. Well, what does this mean? What's what's going on here? And then I kept having conversations with people, um, including the curators of this big show, Oceans Apart, that was put up at Tate Britain a few uh, years ago, looking at artists of the Anglo-Caribbean diaspora. Um, everyone was sort of talking behind the scenes about why there's so many amazing Guyanese artists. What What is with that? element of this diaspora and obviously that's a very incomplete question because always to separate this diaspora from artists who've been active in Guyana in the last 50 to 100 years is problematic and, and reductive and it's something that's happened a lot and, and I'm aware that um, it's frustrating but nonetheless it seemed a very interesting question um, and, and so gradually that's sort of become the project that I've been focusing on so I'm just going to share my screen and show a few images uh, that I've been thinking about as I work on this book project. Um, bear with me just one second. Um, 
Yes, I, I suppose I wanted to start from this moment um, that was quite pivotal for me when I went to um, look at Donald Locke's archive in his um, last family home in Atlanta. And I was there last spring and I was sort of, you know, plowing through all these folders and I um, happen upon a, a folder that perhaps some of you know, I'm not sure, um, it certainly hasn't been circulated into any kind of publication uh, since it was created in the 90s, um, titled The Unknown Shore, um, which contains a lot of drafts for a book that Locke uh, wanted to write or was writing, uh, which never got published. And I don't know exactly the story there, but a book in which he was also trying to, um, he was trying to write a book about modern and contemporary art from Guyana. Really, he was focusing on the diaspora and he makes a slightly sort of con polluted argument as to why focus only on artists of the diaspora uh, but nonetheless he was he was trying to answer some of the questions that I'm also um, getting to grips with and he was doing so partly out of a feeling of frustration that by the sort of end of the 90s various kinds of exhibitions that had focus in the US and Britain on the transnational Caribbean or on, say, Black British artists had sort of not picked up on the significance of Guyana as a kind of starting point um, for the work of many significant artists who he thought were really key figures in the story of modern art. Um, and so he essentially set out to correct the record uh, by producing this book that explores specifically what about the history of Guyana or the geographic conditions of Guyana or um, you know Guyana as a sort of lived setting created um, this roster of artists um, among which he included uh, perhaps more well-known figures like Frank Bowling and Aubrey Williams and his own son um, Hugh Locke and others um, and so um, the many drafts in this folder, The Unknown Shore, became quite important for me in terms of thinking, how do I set up my own book? You know, how do I explain in this book why I have become so interested with this part of the world? Um, and what is it that sets it apart from, say, the wider area studies of, of Caribbean um, history and culture or... Um, as I said, sort of Anglo-Caribbean or British art. And, and so a lot of these questions are still somewhat unresolved for me. Um, and I'm partly wanting to open them up rather than completely resolve them and answer them in my book. Um, I don't know if there is a specific reason why there are so many exceptional artists of Guyanese heritage. Um, um might be interesting to hear your thoughts um but one of the interesting points that Donald Locke made in this draft was around this idea of the black box um and so he wrote in the 90s about um Guyana being like a black box so he had this little phrase in his um draft for an introduction for this book which he said growing up in British Guiana was like living inside a black box. And um, this was a kind an analogy that was, as you can see on screen, meant to, in a way, provide a kind of narrative uh, and a context for his own artworks, and particularly a series of works, uh, sculptures, as well as works on canvas that he made, which he called the black box series. And generally speaking, um, Wait, let me move forward, yeah. Okay, so this is one example, black box with alligator skin. And here are other works that are still part of this uh, black box series on the left, the black garden box, which is a sculptural piece. And then at least on one occasion in the making of this very ambitious installation called The Room, it seems as though Locke sort of scaled up this idea of the black box, taking it from canvas or sculpture into a kind of three-dimensional environment that also included more of his sculptures and some um, black monochromes on canvas on, on around the walls. Um, so it was a recurring theme um, that um, comes back in this sort of 
shapes that prevail in other works beyond his black box series and particularly in in this series of um, canvases and sculptures that he worked on whilst in London in the mid 70s mid to late 70s which he called his plantation pieces which are now um, become quite sought after uh, in collection museum collections particularly in Britain uh, the Tate has just acquired some and I know others are being bought kind of all over the UK at the moment um, and perhaps some of you are familiar with these works um, so on the one hand the black box this concept was a way of talking about Guyana that reflected back on his own work or that positioned his work as a sort of key um, place to understand modern art from Guyana. Um, he also wrote about the, co the concept of the black box relating to, of course, racialized histories of the formation of the country, particularly in relation to the plantation system but also he he wrote quite interestingly in this um, unfinished book about the position that Guyana occupies geographically, which is obviously sort of the first thing you'd think about in terms of separating this context from the kind of why the Caribbean, the field of why the Caribbean studies. Um, and he was particularly interested in how um, colonialism had left a legacy of isolation in a sense uh, because so many of the trade routes coming out of Guyana were connected to either other ports in the Caribbean or directly to um, the imperial metropolis and so um, that um, translated into a relative lack of interaction with surrounding countries uh, and of course the linguistic difference um, between Guyana and countries like Suriname um, or Venezuela. And so in that respect, the idea of the black box becomes this metaphor for a kind of isolation or containment grounded in um, colonial state formation. Um, and at the same time, there's also a way for me, perhaps, of thinking about this black box. I can't help but think about the the plane, the black box of a plane, not least because there are so many aerial metaphors in the work that Don Locke was making around this time. And you can see now one of his paintings from the Plantation series, Stagger Out from the Air, um, which is, I'm sure, uh, you will all understand straight away a reference to um, uh, the plantation landscape uh, off the coast of Guyana as seen from above. So that um, kind of very stark, geometrically partitioned landscape, and particularly the reference here is to Dagarad, a former Dutch plantation. Um, and it makes me think all of these references to seeing from above and seeing Guyana from above and perhaps flying over it do make me think about the black box also as a kind of recording device you know as a kind of vital repository of a kind of code that take gives us sort of a history of the world perhaps that is um, grounded in the history of this nation or the history of the plantation and that's something I'm very interested in how Locke is making this work that is on the surface completely abstract is not giving us an overt narrative, it's not giving us characters, it's not giving us a story that is uh, immediately legible. It's actually pretty much um, structured around um, this high modernist um, tropes or strategies, like the grid and the monochrome around this time and earlier across the 20th century, a sort of classic tropes that modern artists have used from Mondrian. Uh, they're really associated with a relatively rarefied, sometimes felt as inaccessible language that modern art has used um, or modernist artists have developed across the late 19th and but mostly 20th century. Um, but what Locke is doing with it is something much more interesting to me and far more political in a sense because he's sort of processing this language of abstraction and of geometric abstraction through the territory of Guyana and through all of these metaphors um, about 
landscape and Guyanese landscape specifically. And here's where we get to what I'm really interested in, which is how through these artworks and through this text that he was writing that was never published, Donald Locke is not just telling us a story about Guyana or a personal history or his personal vision, but he's really trying to put Guyana and the Guyanese landscape at the center of a kind of history of modern art and modern aesthetics. And the way he's doing this is particularly by rethinking the grid, which is such a big deal for modern artists um, as a uh, form that is that cannot be separated from plantation agriculture and the plantation system. And so he's basically saying, there is a kind of other story of the grid here, which doesn't start, for example, with Russian constructivism and Rodchenko or Mondrian. It starts with the plantation in the new world and it starts, for example, in Guyana. And it tells us something very different about geometry and the kind of, this kind of aesthetic of rationalization of um, lines and symmetry and order and efficiency and that's a racialized history and it's a history that cannot be separated from colonization so he's offering a whole different model for thinking about the history of art and I know many of you won't necessarily be our historians or be invested in these sort of um, kind of genealogies of modern art um, and and so I guess the bottom line here is how this artist is not just making work that sort of gets added to the canon or that it's work that is about a kind of locale, a place about Guyana or it's about autobiography. He's really thinking a very rigorous and ambitious way about how can the voice of Guyana change the history of modern art in a radical sense. And how do I do that by thinking about the kind of forms and shapes and conventions that have structured the canon of modern art and sort of bring this new world perspective to that in a way that I find for me, once you've looked at the painting like Daguerre from the air, you can't quite go back. You can't quite look at a Mondrian painting and not see that plantation grid there as part of the history of modernity and the part, as part of the history um, of this kind of, um, I guess, industrialized modernity that is also behind the work of um, modern artists like Mondrian and others. And this is something that Donald Locke wasn't alone in picking up on. Um, Frank Bowling, for example, wrote his dissertation when he uh, did his degree at the Royal College of Art um, in the early 60s. He wrote a whole um, dissertation about I mean most of the dissertation is he's sort of writing about how he doesn't want to write a dissertation and he doesn't care about writing a dissertation he just wants to be made paintings which is sort of amusing in a kind of juvenile way but um, he's also comes across as extremely clever and sophisticated and part of what he's trying to think about in his dissertation is the work of Mondrian in relation to Dutch environmental planning and particularly in relation to Dutch environmental planning in Guyana and that whole history of the transatlantic world as it might be read back into Mondrian's work in a way that no one had ever done. And it's kind of extraordinary that he was thinking about that at a very young age, um, which to me, as someone who didn't grow up in Guyana, immediately says, well, this is a whole generation of artists for whom these connections are obvious. They are very much inbuilt in their experience of space and environment and history and for them coming to Europe, for example, Britain, and looking at paintings like Mondrian's paintings in um, grand museum collections immediately sort of creates this sort of um, um, takes sort of create this kind of disjuncture in relation to how this material is being talked about in Europe. And immediately they're bringing something else to this. Um, and so that's what I'm interested in mapping out in my book. It's a certain way, is a possible way of seeing the world from Guyana. And what does that tell us in terms of how we write the history of modern art and culture? 
Um, and so I'm thinking about Guyana, not just as a place from which these artists come or a landscape that actually gets represented in the work, but also as a kind of method, what kind of forms of seeing stem from this context and particularly from the context of Guyana approaching independence and then gaining independence and then Guyana in the aftermath of formal decolonization. Um, the book um, that I'm writing is not so much focused on these kinds of works. In a way, these works are sort of framing the discussion. They are uh, very present in the introduction that I'm writing, where I'm making this argument about um, Guyana as a way of seeing and reassessing the world. Um, the works that I then go on to focus on um, are much less concerned with the plantation as a space uh, for where uh, modern identities are formed. And I know that Locke at this time in the 70s was in conversation with sociologists who were thinking about these ideas around plantation economy and plantation system and what it, what it meant to be a plantation society, how useful it might be to define the Caribbean or Guyana in these terms, how restrictive all of these ideas might be. So he's sort of taking his own place in these debates, I think, through these paintings. And also it's, it's significance in a sense that these paintings were made in London and then were shown at the Commonwealth Institute at a time when there was so little awareness about um, the legacies of empire and particularly the racialized legacies of empire. And still to this day, I think these make for very radical works, particularly when displayed in Britain, where there's still a lot of denial about uh, empire's participation in the slave trade, but also um, denial about the afterlife of the plantation past abolition. There is still a huge investment in the United Kingdom in the kind of narrative about um, Britain having taken a lead role in abolition. And part of what these paintings do is demonstrate, and this is something that Locke spoke about explicitly, how his whole childhood was grounded in this um, plantation space and how it dominated his reality growing up in a, a very stifling way. And, it, you know, he said in his words, it dominated everything, it dominated the sky. Um, so this sense that it sort of put a kind of box around the imagination as well, potentially. Um, um, what I'm interested in tracking in the book, once I've sort of established this background, is really where artists go from here, moving outside of the black box and moving outside of the logic of the plantation. So I'm looking at artists who very explicitly made a point in their work of either looking at other landscapes and often the hinterland as a kind of mystical space of um, where alternative and post-colonial identities could be imagined or recovered, uh, where new connections with indigenous ancestry could be forged, perhaps in a romanticized sense or in a very real sense. Um, and so um, that's sort of what's at the center of my book, Living Landscapes. Um, ways of imagining the relationship with the Guyanese landscape and with the planetary landscape that are sort of outside of this logic of the plantation. Um, and so this is a kind of range of, these are some of the artists that I'm working on. Um, and I'm in the process, in conversation with other artists who are um, based in Guyana and so not uh, in the diaspora um, as I'm trying to incorporate that in the book to have uh, move a little bit away from the Donald Locke model of focusing only on the diaspora and try to think in the book, also think about what is the difference between artists who stayed and artists who didn't. Um, and so, uh, yes, these are some of the examples of works that I'm thinking about, which immediately have a very different aesthetic from this sort of geometric abstraction language and speak more of an engagement with expressive or cosmological um, ways of um, communicating or ways of being that um, often um, are really trying to sort of imagine a different way of being in the world, a different way of being Guyanese, a different way of reclaiming different futures and different relationships with landscape. Um, and so for someone like Locke, 
Um, I, I want to argue, and perhaps others won't um, subscribe to this. For me, it feels like going through his um, archive and his estate, here are some more uh, images. It feels like over the course of his career, he moved further and further away from this language of abstraction and this language that perhaps it almost felt like initially in his earlier years, he sort of had to work through these conventions, this modernist conventions that were so dominant, particularly in Europe and in Britain where he studied. And it feels as though the more his career evolves, uh, the more he becomes almost relaxed about that context and starts to really tap into his Guyanese or Afro-Diasporic heritage to look for other ways of expressing, um, as I said, other ways of being, other forms of identity um, and other ways of relating to the landscape and the intense use of words, the same word for me is quite interesting in that respect and the re references. Um, and also to his own background um, in relation to his father having been a pork knocker and this sort of constant romanticization of the hinterland as a sort of space of self-discovery and mystique and um, particularly African, perhaps also indigenous spirituality. Um, and so really the focus of my work is more his later work. Um, and yeah, I think I'm sort of getting to the end of my time slot, but other artists that I'm thinking about along these lines are uh, uh, another important one is, as I said, Aubrey Williams. And this is a painting that's at Castellani House, which I've um, just found completely mesmerizing. And I've been thinking about it for years. And it's one of the only paintings, I think, in which he's used gold. And I've been involved in writing a long chapter about his work and how it relates to landscape and ecology for a major book that will come out next year, a major monograph, which is edited by uh, his daughter, Mary Dower Williams, and a brilliant scholar, um, Ian Dudley. And this is a painted, painting that I write about in that book and that I keep thinking about in terms of uh, this sort of drive to find these other spaces of spirituality and identity outside of the plantation in particular. And this is the kind of painting that um, helps me think about what I mean by living landscape. It's a painting that, um, as some of you will probably know, is inspired or makes reference to um, Amerindian petroglyphs in a very sort of abstracted way. And it, it remains in dialogue with international abstraction, which Aubrey Williams was interested in, but it's so unique, the kind of aesthetics that Williams developed. And what I find interesting looking at the documents partly the life of this painting, which was immediately purchased by the Booker group and that, that kind of relationship with the kind of patronage that the plantation system or the sugar industry also provided for artists in Guyana in the 50s and onwards. And, and then also the way that Aubrey Williams talked about this painting as being um, El Dorado being a kind of national utopia. And, and that was really interesting for me how the narrative of El Dorado was sort of flipped in its on its head and um, I think that this sort of leads me onto maybe saying a little bit more, um, well, maybe I'll come back to it, um, about other research that I'm doing around this theme of El Dorado. But perhaps before I get there, um, as I said, part of the work that I'm doing sort of makes these connections between these early works um, from the 50s and 60s that are partly thinking about independence and what it might mean to sort of reclaim native landscapes or, and to form post-colonial identities through this uh, rediscovery of the hinterland or rediscovery of national folklore and myth. Um, but also how that becomes leads onto a trajectory that sees many of the artists become more and more involved with environmental and ecological ideas. Um, that relate to uh, the relationship between sovereignty and sustainability, the preservation of the hinterland, what it might mean to also protect the nation and, and generally protect um, the, the local landscape. And Aubrey Williams is a very important artist for this. And this is one painting that he made much later in his career, among many others, in which he's really thinking about um, ecological crisis across the Amazon basin and the kind of loss of heritage that that might entail. He's really reading a lot about um, 
fires, uh, the incineration of trees across the Amazon, the paving of new roads in Brazil and in Guyana. And um, his writings are very distressed on this subject. And he makes these paintings as part of a, a very well-known series called the Maya Olmec and Now, in which he's thinking about um, the loss of civilizations like the Mayas and similar implosions that might await industrial civilizations. And he's sort of we can talk a little bit more about, but I don't want to go into much detail because it's a lot of content. But I guess the only point that interests me really here is thinking about how the work of a generation of artists that includes Aubrey Williams, but also future generations of Guyanese artists becomes more and more involved with this relationship between the landscape as a place of belonging and even decolonization and the landscape as a place that needs to be protected increasingly against the threat of ecological erasure and that becomes more and more of a conversation that it develops in relation to climate change for younger artists and so the book I'm writing really tracks this whole story across multiple generations almost moving from a kind of vision of the especially the hinterland as a kind of space of um repair uh, and and rebirth um into more contemporary work that's really thinking about um, sustainability and survival and specifically by commenting on the oil industry but not only so these are a couple of works by um, living artists um, who've been making work that speaks specifically to the oil industry boom in Guyana and the expectations and problems associated with that and and this um, will, part of some of these ideas will come together hopefully in a project that is perhaps more accessible that I'm working on um, with um, curator Grace Anisa Ali. We are in the midst of trying to uh, establish secure venues and um, gather funding for this uh, exhibition that we are, and research program that we are putting together which is on the theme of El Dorado. And it's really a way of telling a story about Guyana across the world. We hope this will be a traveling exhibition by revisiting this story of El Dorado, um, in part to show how many extraordinary artists since the fifties in particular have made work that sort of reinvents the myth of El Dorado or messes with it or manipulates it and obviously Wilson Harris being a huge influence there uh, and increasingly the work is sort of referencing the oil Dorado so there are increasingly I feel in the younger artists um, increasingly the connotations of this reappropriation of the El Dorado myth are uh, environmental and so we are trying to put together an exhibition that sort of maps out this story and really kind of puts Guyana at the center of this story of the world that um, spans from uh, the kind of fantasies and desires of white settler colonials in the new world and brings in ways in which the, a story like El Dorado has been rewritten and recoded and reimagined from Guyana, from alternative perspectives that are nothing to do with sort of the white settler dream of colonization uh, and to the point where El Dorado also became a kind of, um, as Aubrey Williams saw it, a sort of utopia of independence um, into the present where El Dorado is becoming more and more a way of telling a story about planetary disaster and extraction and mining and how to sort of resist that. So that's the a separate project that I thought I might just offer for reflection um, and which is in process and I'm going to leave it there because it's a lot of content already so thank you for listening thank you um Julia that was fantastic um let me just um remove your spotlight for a minute so um Julia's actually got to or may not be able to stay with us for very long um because she's got family commitments so I just wanted to Normally we do the Q&A at the end, but I just wanted to invite anybody who's online at the moment who wants to, um, if you've got any questions, um, let us know now. Um, I saw a few people online who are particularly interested in the area of art, um, including Stanley Greaves, um, 
and Akima McPherson, um, Jane, Thackerden. I don't know, do, do any of you have any particular questions you'd like to address to Julia? I've got Stanley, you need to um, unmute Stanley. You're on, you're, you need to unmute yourself. That's it, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Smith, for your interesting talk. First thing, I find your thesis extremely broad. And um, I think you need to concentrate on one particular thing. This colonial, there's a colonial thing, there's a hinterland thing, um, which are linked somehow. But for those who are living in Guyana at a certain period of time, the hinterland has nothing to do with colonialism. Mm. Now, for instance, I have spent um, 10 years camping in the hinterland, sometimes twice a year, sometimes once a year. And once you leave the coastland, which is the plantation area, you are in a different time and space entirely. Um, a number of things. One, first of all, I know Donald because we were both in the working people's of our class together in the 1940s right through until he left Guyana. And one of the things I must say with um, with Donald, um, his son, Aubrey Williams, Donald Williams, um, is that there was this thing about wanting to be recognized as artists. And recognition will come from living in the metropolis, not in Guyana. So, you are a Guyanese artist, but you're living in the metropolis. The work which is being produced in the metropolis does not reach the people in Guyana. They don't know nothing about it, very little about it. Um, the language, again, modernism, the language which is being used to express ideas about Guyana is virtually meaningless to a great part of the population of Guyana because of the lack of a certain kind of visual education in schools. So people are not educated. We are educated in language and numbers, but not in 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 the visual, in the visuals. And so this is where the whole movement of art in Guyana falls down, because people are not educated to know how to respond to the work produced by artists. Now, um, the thing about the, the the hinterland and environment. Very few Guyanese artists have, have lived or worked or traveled in the hinterland. Very few. Ron Savory is one of the few who actually lived and worked in the in the in the in the hinterland. Aubrey Williams has visited visited uh, uh, the hinterland, but um, the thing I find is this this question of identity that we talk about, and the fact that artists feel the need to leave Guyana in order to achieve an identity. Um, Bowling never shows work in Guyana. Hugh Locke has not shown his work in Guyana, unless you see it on the video or whatever. Um, Aubrey Williams a show. Dennis Williams came back again and did some work, but he, um, just a few paintings. Aubrey Williams visited Guyana quite often, but um, just showed a few paintings, some of which are in the National Collection. So there was a sort of, um, non-existence of dialogue between the artists who are now actually living in Guyana and those who are outside of Guyana. There's no dialogue, you know. So then it, it, it creates a problem because in other words, we get a kind of a kind of a split, a split situation. Those are at home and those are abroad. Now talking about the landscape, the artists that you need to see the work. I don't know how many artists in Guyana you've, you've actually seen and visited. Is Bernadette Prasad? No, no. Okay, so you've seen Bernadette? I've seen Bernadette and I, I've not done, I've, but I also feel now I have to just out this whole thing, but it's, fair, it's a fair point. I would like to have a, a studio visit with Bernadette, but I've also been holding off until I have a very precise idea of how I want to include them. You want to proceed, yes. But I also, you know, I was also thinking about, um, I know I'm a bit worried about the Locke family maybe then becoming too present, but I've had an interesting conversation with Hugh Locke also about his mother mm -hmm. and those paintings of yards. Um, 
-hmm. And the swimming pool that he, she did, the tiles for the Burnham family swimming pool. Yes, yes. And mm -hmm. That stuff is really interesting. And I would quite like to have that in the book. And I, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll bear in mind what you said, but I like the structure of the book in the sense that it's not a book that's trying to tell a linear, clean or comprehensive story. It's this sort of moment. And so you have the black box because there is also internal diversity in what Guyanese artists have been doing and how they've been thinking. So there is this idea of the black box is a moment in the introduction. I have a chapter that's about the hinterland. Of course, you could write a book about the hinterland and about, of course, not many artists actually went there. Mm -hmm. It was. It's more about. I think Dennis Williams thought about. You know, wrote about this and quite uh, kind of hit the spot in saying it is a sort of fantasy that you belong oh. there and it's part of you, even though you've never been. And that's this has mm -hmm. this kind of mythic status. And so, in a way, the hinterland is a kind of image in the first place before it's even made into a painting or um so it's very interesting you know um bowling does a lot of stuff that to me has to do with this myth mystique of the hinterland even though he's very uneasy about having the paintings associated with kayato and whatnot but so the hinterland is a chapter every chapter is a kind of zooming into a theme and I want the book to be used for teaching as well. I want it to be used, you know, it would be amazing if it could be used in some form uh, within a kind of Guyanese context. I certainly want it to be used for teaching at universities where in the UK where I study that I understand the system better. And so I want it to spotlight different themes and different moments because I want students to be able to kind of see that range. And mm -hmm. that's that's my thinking. Um, but I appreciate a lot of what you said. And I find it very difficult to think about how can I narrate this rift between outside and inside. And in a way, part of the, one of the questions that I ask in the introduction is, is also, you know, where is Guyana? You know, sure, we can know where it is physically, but it's who is in Guyana and of Guyana. It's a very nuanced. <laughs> Set of questions, and there are many ways of being an, a non, an outsider. Either because you're, yeah, left, that, you know, you're white like me. You're not from Guyana, and obviously, I get asked all the time, like, "You're not from Guyana. You're not Guyanese. Why are you writing this book?" You know, yeah. This, this, yeah. You know, um, that's a very fine distinction. Who is is and of Guyana, and it's, it's it's a distinction that has to be made. Who is and of Guyana? Because there are people who are of Guyana not living in Guyana, producing things, producing artwork, giving Guyanese names. I don't know what those names mean to views in the metropolis. I don't know how they make that connection. And um, the thing about Donald in the Black Box, has, it has an interesting history because um, Donald, when he left and he came to, he, he was in Britain, first of all, and then he left and he went across to America and he was, he was um, attached to the studio museum in Harlem at the time of the Black Power Movement. So Donald wanted to get into that. So yeah. when he moved from the Black Power Movement, then he went into Arizona and he started doing these black paintings and putting them in the landscape and things like that. But as far as I'm concerned, um, I have used, I use black a lot in my paintings because my father used to be a sign painter and I like I like painting using black in, in, in work I've done. Um, but Guyana is green. You get into the hinterland, and that's what you have to deal with. Green, not black. So and that I, black is a kind of metaphor because Dan is referring to, that, to the plantation thing or whatever. But the, the, the impact of the plantation is a historic thing. But for the people living in Guyana, um, that, that, that historic kind of connection that is made in the plantation and life on the plantation, it is it exists there somewhere, but it doesn't impact on the lives of the people right now uh, i i um i've been in the hinterland in uh, various places and 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 i, I feel even uh, for me georgetown is green there's mint green there's emerald green there's pistachio i felt even that the more urban areas of guyana there was so much this incredible range of greens and i was asking 
because Hugh Locke was looking at some of his father's paintings with me and mm -hmm. he was telling me, which were primarily black and white, and he was telling me these are Guyana colours. And I was asking, what do you mean? I don't associate these colours at all with Guyana. And well, he said, like, well, I can't explain that. Hmm. And uh, so I'm still left <laughs> with this. But black, no, green, yes. Green and brown. The brown of the river water and the green of the forest. The white of the, 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 um, the white sands, those are the colors. The red laterite rocks, the white uh, crystal sands, quartz, which apparently is about 99 or something percent pure crystal for glass making. Uh, the white sands, the, box, the colors in the bauxite, the reds and the browns, those are the colors. Green predominates, of course. Um, one of the things about Guyana is the landscape. And I'm showing you here um, Bobby Fernandez's book because he did a lot of photographs of the interior. And this waterfall is a waterfall called Chinnacook. And I've seen lots of waterfalls. And that is the one that made an impression because that's the one had, as far as I'm concerned, a very, very strong spiritual element to it. So as far as I'm, forget about culture is power. I've been there several times. The culture is power, but for me, the spirituality is in that one. I just showed a place called Chinnacook in the Mazaruni. Um, this business of isolation, the isolation came about because of how the Caribbean is formed geologically. It's an archipelago. So then contact between the islands and the mainland Guyana is not very strong. At one time, the contact was through, especially between St. Lucia and Barbados, because of the, the trade with schooners. And I love boats. I make boats. I make models of boats. I love sailing boats. I used to go look at them and do them. But that was a contact. The contact with artists did not begin until the uh, Carifesta 72 is when we first saw the work of artists. I remember. Um, my memory for names, uh, the artist from uh, Jamaica, his wife also paints. When he came and he saw what was going on, he immediately left and went back to Jamaica and said, no, you've got to send Bet to work to show him, Parbu Singh. Parbu Singh came and saw what was going on, went back to Jamaica and said, no, 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 you have to send Bet to work. So that's the first time we saw work um, uh, um, you know, from, from the, it was, some, it was an eye opener. But it's also showed how isolated um, isolated we were. And then each island will focus on aspects of their visual culture and their culture, what have you. They'll do that. Um, I saw two exhibitions, I think it's something islands in New York. There were two visiting islands or something like that. There were two, there were two exhibitions about work from the Caribbean. When you went into those exhibitions, what you were seeing was individual expressions. So as far as I'm concerned, dealing with the Caribbean, you're dealing with a mosaic. That linear, that linear thing, the only linear connection is because colonialism, but otherwise than that, you have to deal with a mosaic. And when you come to Guyana, you have the mosaic again. So it's a mosaic squared. So you have to deal with these various um, uh, visions, how people perceive their, their environment. What I had problems because one, I'm reading books about the history of art and Montreal and those people, all of those guys, and I'm in Guyana and I'm working and I said, but why do I have to look at the works of these people in order to give me a direction in which I want to go? No way. So this thing about Montreal and trying to link Montreal <laughs> with the plantation system and the grid, I think is a bit far-fetched because the grid system came from the Dutch. It's the Dutch who imposed the grid system in Guyana and that's how they organized their own, their own land. You know, so I, I don't I don't go with that one, with the grid and Montreal and imposing that that view of Montreal and the grid on the Guyana coastland, which is where the grid occurs, only on the coastland. So it's just a kind of an isolated, an isolated thing. Um, modernism in Guyana began really in the 1950s in the working people's art class, and that was Donna Locke, myself and Patrick Barrington, landscape, Patrick Barrington. 
who really got into landscape painting before Ron Saver. You have Ron Saver as well who did landscapes from the interior. So it was Patrick Barrington, Donald Lock, and myself who were looking at what was going on in the metropolis and wondering what do we do about it. Barrington went to the English landscape painters. Donald was copying, uh, um, uh, making uh, uh, works in the style of Picasso. I was doing my own thing because I couldn't go to those guys. I had to find my own language. And it was very, very extremely difficult. And the one, the one thing I came up with for myself was imagination first, your own mm -hmm. personal imagination and how that is used in order to deal with your environment and forget about the modernists. Now we are all influenced by them, myself as well. But you, you always try to use the modernist language in a way that makes sense for the context in which the work belongs. Mm. Stanley, Stanley. The I am... at El Dorado, I have, I have done a series of 26, uh, 24, 14, 14 uh, pieces of sculpture based on the El Dorado legend. You know, so there's a lot of work over there. It's a question yeah. on your, it's a question on your focus. Uh, well, sorry, Stanley, wasn't Mondrian Dutch? What? Wasn't yeah. Mondrian Dutch? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he was. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I, I thought you, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so, but, so, but Stanley, I'm sorry, we, we're gonna, we're a bit pushed for time and I just want to check if anybody yeah, else had I, I any questions talk, before. Yeah, I, I we know, Stanley, we know. I can talk within <laughs> two or three hours. Yeah, I know. I know, and it's very interesting listening to you, but I just wanted to check if anybody else had any questions before we move on. Also, okay. I know I noticed Bernadette um is online. Bernadette Passard, I think she probably missed the first um actually probably missed your talk, but I just wanted to say welcome to Bernadette and also Akima who's um online. Um Jane, did you have any questions about the talk? Hi, hi, Juanita. Sorry, I just trying to unmute myself there. I was just mesmerized by that conversation between um, Stanley and Julia. That was really, really interesting. So I, I, would, I did a big thumbs up when you mentioned um, Bernadette Passord because I'd written her name down and apologies for missing the beginning of the talk, um, uh, Juliana, but I really did enjoy it. But I was just thinking from a kind of, um, one of the observations that I've made, and it might be, you know, this is mine, so I can only speak for myself, is having visited um, Guyana a couple of times and um, been to Castellini House and looked at the archive, is I am quite taken by the lack of representation of women Guyanese artists, a, a kind of cross the arts kind of um, history, really. And I don't know whether that's because, um, I don't know what that's about, I don't know what it's about, but I, I'm always very kind of aware and conscious that when we, when we look and talk about the main kind of, um, the most kind of um, popular or well-known artists of the kind of Guyanese diaspora. We're often looking at male artists, which is fine, but I can't, I was, my, sorry, my washing machine's about to go crazy. Um, but I also feel as though, you know, we need to shed some light, shine some light on the women and the feminist artists of the Guyanese diaspora and those that are also in Guyana. But fascinating um, thought, and it's a PhD in itself, isn't it? The difference between artists who are, in Guyana now and those that have left Guyana and the difference in their in their influence and making of art but but thank you very much fascinating fascinating afternoon thanks for that um I think Judith Toppin has her hand raised um also um just while I noticed that some of the names I can't see all the names online but I know Arlington um Withers who's also a Guyanese artist is on online um, and his work is also grounded in, in the Guyana landscape. So I don't know, Arlington, if you had a question, um, but I'm just going to come to Judith Toppin first, if I can. Uh, okay, could you hear me though? All right. Judith? Julia, can I just check yeah. with you? Do you need to go any second now? Because I know you've, you've got things you need to do. No? Okay, good. Um, Judith, if you... Yeah. Are you there? Okay, put your yes. question, please. Yes. Uh, go um, ahead. Yes, thanks. My my question is 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 more a comment, and I wanted to thank um, Dr. Smith for a really interesting um, presentation. Um, but my I have two uh, short questions. 
One is what what because uh, I missed right at the beginning, so I'm not sure if you mentioned it. But what what did the what guided your selection of the artists that you were covering in your work? Um, and I'm following on on the on uh, Ms. Takarin's comment. Uh, I noticed that there weren't any women included in your in the persons the artists covered. And I just again wondered about the selection because, as you may or I'm I'm sure that you know that there is a Guyanese Women Artists Association that has been around for some years. And so in addition to Ms. Facade, there are a number of other Guyanese artists who have done credible work. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that, but also to, to find out from you what, what may have guided your selection of the artists for your work. Thank you. Um, I think I'm gonna condense those comments and, and questions in, in one. The selection I showed you on screen is a partial selection as not all the artists I'm um, working on. And it did include Sukitra Matai and Rashini Kempadu, who are women. Um, the final selection of artists is not final in the sense that I'm, I'm still working on the book and I'm hoping to extend the time I have to work on it because of this reason, because I think I there's a way in which I need to wrap up this project and I and go with the artists that I know best now and then build on it and expand it more for example through the El Dorado uh, project that I'm working with Grace Ali on and hoping to get funding for um, but I the more I think of it the more I think the research needs a little bit more time for my book as well so I don't have a definitive answer you know I don't have a final list of artists who are in or out at the moment but it won't cover enough artists because I think that a lot more work needs to be done than can be contained I'm not writing a kind of encyclopedic or final book about who the who is who and what they're doing Guyanese modern art that's not what I'm doing it's too big a project and it's not what I have the re resources to do at the moment. I'm writing a thematic, as I said, I'm spotlighting some themes. And I feel now that uh, Bernadette is in the audience. We met some years ago, and perhaps you won't remember Bernadette, but I'm gonna say it now because um, it is a constant um, of people telling me, you need to talk to Bernadette, you need to talk, to, and not just in this forum. And the answer that I've given publicly is I know, and I have, overwhelming childcare duties now and in this period of my life but on my top priority top of my list when I get back to work is try to see if Bernadette has some time to meet with me and talk about her work so I'm just going to put that out there um, and I don't necessarily would like to approach Bernadette or other artists through the lens of gender at this stage um, I read a very interesting essay by Ofrida uh, Bissenberg about uh, a show or re a reflection of women artists which included uh, Bernadette's work and also um, Hugh Locke's mother's work and that's the kind of text that I'd like to include in the book in terms of um, honoring the historiography that already exists on Guyanese art which Ofrida is um, an important voice uh in in there and I feel very lucky that I got to meet Elfrida a few years ago and and you know everything she says is gold and I was you know it was fantastic to uh, meet her and so that's an essay I want to go back to and and that will allow me to reflect on gender but I I just want to know more about these artists work including Bernadette before sort of framing them through gender because perhaps that's that might be st too strict a framework and I don't know how they feel about it yet. Um, but yes, it, it's absolutely true. If I were to focus just on the diaspora or follow the pattern of the book that Donald Locke planned out in the nineties, it would be all men. Okay. We need he probably says something yes. about kind of opportunities, you know, coming from the fifth, you know, a generational conversation there, but also, you know, who got to migrate on what terms, what kind of opportunities were available through the sort of scholarships that some of these artists got in the fifties and sixties and how gender sort of run through all of those systems. Thank you, Julia. Um, I'm just going to bring in now um, Arlington. Yes. Thank you. Uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, first time in the Zoom conference. 
uh, Dr. Smith, I, I may be able to uh, share though, um, first thing comes to mind, something pertaining to Donald and um, <laughs> even his black box and clearly his paintings. Interestingly enough, uh, Donald was colorblind. So he had difficulties really with color. Mm -hmm. So he had been working primarily uh, within a, a a black and white, uh, 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 you know, tonality of work. Uh, it, it is interesting that, um, uh, and speaking about that, Donald did do uh, some paintings. Uh, on our Amerindian uh, uh, series that was basically black and white, uh, had an exhibition uh, at the John F. Kennedy uh, Library, a place um, that we use for showing works. And it's interesting that some of his black and white works were uh, a source of inspiration to me. Uh, it, it is interesting that uh, right now there is an exhibition that uh, opened up on the 11th of September uh, at Haynes Gallery at Wake Forest University uh, entitled White Balance, uh, where uh, I've got a uh, huge nine foot by 20 foot paintings on display. Oh, uh, Stanley, I'm hoping that you might be able to make it from Raleigh. Uh, I'll be giving a talk uh, October 19. And even within that work, uh, I coming from even the early inspiration in Guyana from Donald Locke, uh, I have been now working on large scale white paintings that still deals with the same issues. Um, um, one of the paintings, an archaeologist came and saw my work and asked if I was concerned about excavations. Well, for people who do not know, um, my cousin is Dennis Williams. He was the early point of my inspiration getting into art. And so his book, uh, African Art, Icon and Image, the work that he did in the hinterland of Guyana, all those things become... Uh, Father, they enter into the mind, uh, even subconsciously, and then they come out in paintings. So my work uh, is, even though I no, left Guyana to come and study art in New York, um, the whole notion of, of uh, nostalgic return to homeland uh, is within my work. Uh, in fact, um, uh, I was the first one to, to leave Guyana to come to study art. And so I was torn away from Mother Guyana. So uh, within my work, uh, uh, I am dealing with um, post-modernity in, in, in um, relating to fragmentations that come as a result of, you know, moving from clearly, you know, Guyana uh, into a, what you would call first world country, uh, uh, those are things that comes out within the work. So coming back to Donald, he admitted to me the struggles and you're dealing with a call and response as a younger artist. Um, he was in Atlanta. I was at the time at Tuskegee University. So I will go down to Atlanta and see Donald. And it's interesting in much of his later works and bigger works came from uh, you know, the, the kind of influence. Boy, let me see some of your work. So drove my truck with, with you know, a, a six foot by seven foot painting. And he's saying, man, you know, with, with these kinds of paintings that you're doing, plus now the color that is within the work. I want to come back now to something that Stanley said. Yes, even though Don was working in black and white is because of that particular problem. But I did influence him where he says, boy, I need to start, you know, you're affecting me here. I need to start putting some color in my work. 
So he began now with reds and then blues and greens because um, uh, I think they should still be in the archives. Uh, I will then now turn around and photograph Donald's work. So uh, D D Donald became uh, important to me in 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 in, in 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 that regard. And then now, of course, besides now the whole idea of excavating, discovering things, th there is also the whole idea of uh, the ecological idea, Guyana being below sea level. And so we've got flooding. What happens to the land when, you know, the sun comes and now bakes the land? It begins to get uh, uh, dry. It begins to crack and split. So within my work, uh, I, I am dealing with fractura, uh, the the whole concept that uh, relates then to the, the physicality of Guyana's land. Yet within my work, um, there are these allusions to nature. I do say they're landscapes of the mind, but uh, I am still concerned that my work be read uh, inviolably abstract in that regard. But all the references to Guyana is still there, and these are some of the things that I'll be bringing out in the talk that I'll be giving uh, in a couple of three weeks. Where? This would be at Wake Forest University. Uh, they, 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 they have a Haynes Gallery there, and um, six of my large works my largest is 21 foot. I've got four of them that's 20 foot wide. Uh, and in dealing with the history, though, of now of white painting, going back to the Russian artist, 19th supremacist white, uh, there is no one now who has done uh, this large scale white paintings. So uh, um, I will send the essay you know, to, to, to you then, Dr. Smith, uh, along clearly with with some images. So it, it is a, uh, a a powerful exhibition. Uh, uh... I just want to say thank you for sharing all of that. I'm very grateful. I have put my email in the chat. So if anyone feels inclined to share anything that they feel would be relevant, um, I would be very keen to read or look at any material and um, perhaps just ending my session by also adding that in terms of the work on women artists and thinking a little bit more about that gender disparity, I want to acknowledge work that's already there. Someone in the chat, Brenda Locke in the chat, put a reference to Grace Ali's book, Liminal Spaces, which is beautiful and, and brilliant and uh, just to acknowledge that that work is being done too, or that I'm also referring well, to. I, actually, in Liminal Space, which is an exhibition we had uh, about four or five years back, it's interesting that Grace Ali did have one of my large white paintings there. It was a nine foot by Arlington. Arlington, yes. I'm sorry to cut you. We need to go to the next okay. um, speaker. Well. But I just wanted to say to you, you your, your work sounds really fascinating. So we'd love to have you on a separate Guy and a Speaks program if you're interested. Um, it'd be great to hear more about your work. Very well. I'd be delighted. Good. So if you could share your um, email address with me in the chat, that would be fantastic. I've just sent you a little message if you could do that. But um, I, I just wondered if we could take this opportunity to just put our hands together and say thank you so much to Julia um, for a really fascinating talk. So, Julia, thank you so much. Thank and, uh, yeah, unfortunately, thank obviously, you, thank, it's, you, thank, you. It, thank, thank you both of you and also to Stanley and everybody who um, contributed to the Q&A section there. Um, and... Um, I've I've seemed to have got you stuck on the screen, Arlington. Um, Julia, are you still there? Yeah, yeah. You so are okay. You okay yeah, fantastic. You know, thank you, thank you all. And I'm, you know, ever the sort of beginner and the curious learner in this field. So thank you all so much for your feedback. No, it's brilliant. It was brilliant having you, and I'm. I feel like I've learned a lot. So that's 
that's good and and I love the kind of interaction we've all had so thank you so much Julia and um we'll no doubt stay in touch with you and follow your work and when your book's ready please let us know and we'll have you back on again a uh, quick word the Guyana Women's Artists Association began in my